basically to let you know more about Level Ground and our approach to how we do business. And um, let's try to make it two-way rather than me just going at you. So if you've got comments or ideas or thoughts or questions, feel free. If you think it's too big or too heavy of a topic for the group, or me, if I look frail. Um, <laughs> my cards are over on the table where the coffee and tea is. You can send me an email later and grab that. I've also got these here for later on. And it's just basically an invite for you to come on a tour. And it's got all the info to come on a tour and send me an email. So if you'd like to come to Level Ground and bring eight or 30 friends, um, come on over, invite yourself over. We'll set something up and you can taste some coffees and teas and some of our other products and put on a hairnet and, and tour through and take photos and learn about how we do what we do. So I understand that I've got at least an hour, maybe more. <laughs> And I have the ability to talk for long periods of time. But I hope you can make it really interactive as well. I've got a pile of stuff to share with you, so I'll get going. We started our business in 97, the same time my wife and I were getting ready to become parents for the first time. We've actually got four kids, all from four different birth families. So we've got quite a deep DNA pool in our family. Our youngest is in grade one, and our oldest just graduated and is in college, just got out of high school. So uh, he's 19 now, and we were just getting going as a family and starting to research the ideas behind what was bringing about our parenting approach to adopting kids out of Haiti. And uh, I started to look a lot at global trade and think about where money went and historically how trade has happened around the world. And when you look at a lot of Europe's behaviors going back a few generations, you see that they had a lot of appetite for product coming from countries they've colonized. And Haiti was really built on... West African slavery producing sugar for European sweet tooth. And it became and stayed for a long time now one of the poorest countries in the world. And I had this strange privilege of parenting kids who were born to other families because of the injustice and the imbalance that happens currently in a global economy. <coughs> and my initial responses were largely anger and criticism and frustration sometimes a fetal position of helplessness, <laughs> not knowing how to respond to big problems in the world. And my desire, once I got through that over a few years of wrestling it out, was to figure out how to find solution-oriented, positive approaches to the challenges I saw around me, which each of us, when we take that on, it becomes a lot more life-giving than life-draining, but you're still tackling big stuff. So. One thing that's happened for my wife and I is that we've discovered that as we've gotten more and more into trading with small-scale farmers around the world as a business, we've become deeply in love with being small-scale farmers ourselves. And so actually when we connect with farmers, we're connecting mostly as farmers with farmers rather than as buyers and farmers. So this is a little bit of where we live in Brentwood Bay, a few kilometers from here. As with, uh, oh, I had a pointer so I can like laser point and stuff, so I'll just grab that. Um, as with any farm, when you show up first, you meet our dog, right? That's Soda Pop, jump in the fence there. <laughs> He's always the first one to come out and greet people. We manage all of our pests with a little flock of hungry ducks. And so that's how uh, things get nibbled. If you're planting seedlings in the spring in Victoria, you know that slugs and snails get most everything at first. But if you've got ducks, well, maybe a laser pointer doesn't even work in this light. Oh, there it is. Yeah, if you've got ducks, that, that munches through them right away. We grow a lot of different berries and fruits on our place. And one of the things we said about quite a few years ago being vegetarian was that if we were going to move back into eating meat, it was going to be meat that we produced ourselves. This is Tina Turner, one of our funkiest ever chickens. <laughs> and no two of our birds are the same because I've, I've over the years just developed a really deep variety of dual purpose birds where the roosters are perfect for meat and the hens are great for laying. And so each year the kids kind of run a beauty contest for the roosters so the two or three best looking ones get to live and all of their brothers and half-brothers end up in the freezer. And so we butchered 52 roosters last year as a family and kept the three best ones that the kids considered it for breeding stock. And then um, after about a year's time, we gather the eggs from those mature hens and we incubate those out to create the next year's flock. And then on Used Victoria, we post ads for our slightly used hens and people take them onto their farms and they continue to live other places. If a hen's more than a couple years old, you don't get as good success hatching the eggs out even though they'll still keep on laying. Um, this is my great story this week. Um, if you've ever heard the term of being broody, the idea of being broody means that the hen wants to sit on eggs and not leave because she wants to be there long enough to hatch them out. And so one day, three weeks ago, 
she got broody on me, and they just kind of settle down in the nesting box, and when you come to collect the eggs, they might just make grumpy noises, or they might peck at you, but she clearly wanted to just sit on eggs. So I thought, what the heck? I grabbed all the eggs that were in the coop, dragged her in the barn, put her in a warm room, gave her food and water, and set her on the eggs. 16 eggs. And yesterday she hatched 15 chicks. 15 out of 16 is a great record. I've never got better than about 80% on a tray of eggs. So she's very good for a first timer, I thought. Really, really cool to see. So every chick is from a different mom because they were all eggs laid on the same day. She just got to hatch them all. So that was great. And I walked in the coop today to take this photo, and I got it quick, but then she just makes a little noise, she fluffs out her wings, and all the chicks scoot out her. She puts them down, and you don't see a single chick in there. <laughs> she can fit all 15 under herself. Yeah. Um, we convert one of our gardens most years, we have it this year, to a five pig raising compound. And they spend winter rototilling through the soil and eating whatever food was left behind, and we get barley from local breweries and food from local farms. And then we keep one and sell the other four. And last year, the day that I pulled the pigs out, I just pulled the fence down and planted the whole garden the same day. Well, the fertility of the soil is just ridiculous. Everything we ate for Thanksgiving this year with about 20 people in the house was out of the garden. The meat, all the vegetables, all the berries, everything. So that's been a really great way to raise meat. This is my, my favorite animal. This is Yogi the cow. And um, she has this incredible ability to turn grass into soil in one hour. <laughs> so she cuts all our grass for us. We just live on an acre and a half. It's a very small place. But she cuts almost all the grass. I keep her back with just one electric wire that's a meter off the ground. So the ducks and chickens can scoot under and spread all the manure out evenly. We've had her for three years, and every year the grass is greener, grows earlier, lasts longer, is more lush, so she's creating her own food. And then her calf, usually within one day, figures out the electric fence. By day two, the calf, both years, has figured it out right away. And this is a little girl that was born in spring, so she actually went back to the family we bought mama from. So she's going to grow up to be a milk cow. And um, it's been a great experience. One of the things I find as I think about sustainability is when you look at current models of what we do, then how could you put it on its head and rethink how to do it? And one of the big issues to cover in sustainability is eating meat and eating large animals specifically, the least efficient animals that you can turn into food. It takes about eight pounds of grain to get one pound of beef, but only two pounds of grain to get one pound of chicken. The smaller the animal is, the more efficient it is. As soon as you have meat that's butchered, you've got refrigeration and freezing and spoilage issues, where if you took all the grains and other foods that went into that animal, there's no refrigeration or freezing issues. You can just have dry seeds or dry grain. It's much less energy intensive to store, to transport. You can eat those eight pounds of grain rather than get one pound of meat out of it. Yogi produced over 3,000 pounds of milk this year. About four or five times her body weight. If I butchered her, I'd get 400 pounds of meat once. You only get half the live weight in meat. And that'd be it. She'd be gone. I'd have to raise another animal for two or three years to get another 400 pounds of meat of that breed. But if she stays healthy and she does well, doesn't break a leg, she's going to have at least a dozen calves in her life. She'll produce 30 or 40,000 pounds of milk. I have a little wine fridge in the barn with all these two pound cheeses. And every two pound cheese requires 20 liters of milk. So there's hundreds of liters of milk represented in all these little two pound spheres of cheese we've made of Pavarti and Parmesan and Gouda and such. It's mind blowing. So my teenage boys know how to milk a cow now. My kids get to see the calf be born. They don't have to cut the grass. <laughs> it's a good thing. Uh, bees are my biggest love on our farm. I have three hives now. I just got into it a few years ago. This is mid-January last winter, when it had been below zero every day, all day, for a couple weeks. And we got one warm day. And they all came up to fly around. And what I've discovered is that bees are a really great way to get a spotlight on the area where you live. Because if the hive's right here, they can fly two kilometers in every direction to bring back nectar and pollen to the hive. And when a, a bee has returned from successfully foraging, you can tell very quickly at a glance. You can just stand a meter from the hive and look at her hind legs. They'll be covered in the pollen. The nectar's in her belly. That'll turn into honey. But the pollen remains pollen. One's carbohydrate, one's protein. And the pollen at this time of the year is very different in color depending on the food sources. So I've got bees coming in right now today and one will have pollen on its hind legs the color of a banana peel, and the next one will have pollen like, like your vest, like a deep apple red. 
because they're going to different places to find food. And there's so much that's, that's flowering right now. It's amazing. And the successful foragers, they get followed back into the hive by those about to leave. And they do a dance, a figure eight dance, for the outgoing foragers to learn the direction and distance and angle to the sun. And those watchers of the dance download the GPS coordinates of the successful forager who's just returned. And then they take that and they fly off to the same food source she just returned from. But if you spray Roundup on your dandelions, the first pollen and nectar source of spring, those chemicals that are designed to disrupt organisms destroy the nervous system and hence the navigation system of a bee. She doesn't make it back. And the same family that will be spraying their weeds to kill the first food source of spring for the bee might have a backyard garden or buy from a local market and at least 50% of our food has to be pollinated by those bees. So we end up killing our own food system. This continually strikes me. Right now, my hives are further ahead in early March than they were last year in, in mid-June, even early July, because it's been so warm. They're kind of running off the frames when I pull them out. It's just wow. amazing to see. It's freezing every night at my farm, but there's every stage of new brood hatching out and emerging, because they have enough energy stores to stay warm and hover around the babies as they hatch. So it's, it's really exciting to be in the hive this time of year. So the thing that I've taken out of that as a, as a farmer wanting to continually learn is that these are a barometer of our farming practices. Everyone seems to know. It's, it's not a, a surprise to anyone to hear that bee populations are in crisis, right? You guys have all heard that? But most people talk about it like it's confusing or mysterious, and it isn't at all. When you monocrop and then use chemicals, you know, monocrop, just one thing growing at a time, and it might be a 50 or 100 or 1,000 acre crop, according to Canadian agricultural practices, you create something that maybe can be pollinated for two weeks, and that's the only food source as far as the bee can fly. But just like those dandelions in spring, you keep the blackberries on your fence line in fall, and you end up with a February through to October nectar flow, and the bees do wonderfully. Let my neighbors spray Roundup on their fence lines because they don't want grass growing up in the metal fencing for aesthetic purposes. They keep killing the food. So we basically get what we, you know, it's, it's the root cause it is affected by our everyday behaviors. And so I guess a lot of questions that I end up creating for myself and want to pass on to others is what food system are we supporting? And most people don't get to know because we don't have access to the production of the product to be able to understand what the outcomes are. Uh, I do a test for mites. Anyone keeping bees has to do a test for mites. They showed up in Canada in the 80s, and mites to a bee are worse than fleas to a dog. They'll infest very quickly, and then if you don't treat them, unfortunately, they'll take over the hive. They actually eat the babies before they hatch. And they can transfer from one hive to another if two bees from different hives meet up on the same flower. So you can have a mite-free hive, and the next week you can have an infestation. So it's really simple to test. This is the bottom board. It slides in and out of the bottom of the hive. And this is an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And you, our old level ground logo there, old letterhead. And uh, I just painted it with a cooking brush with olive oil. You slide that bottom board under the hive for 24 hours. And when you pull it out, you just count how many mites you see with a magnifying glass on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. You see that for winter, I've closed off most of my bee entry, so the entry's right here. That's all pollen that fell off the bee's legs. Isn't that cool? I scooped that up to a half cup, and that happened in 24 hours. A half cup of pollen fell off their legs in 24 hours. Like, they were bringing a lot of food in. I didn't have any mites on any of my hives. But there's almost no way chemical-free to treat for mites right now, because they're so... Uh, they're so vigorous, they just grow so well. So there's a lot of enemies to bees doing well. So all that to say, in my own experience, I continue to learn and be challenged by the fact that sustainability starts at home. I don't feel like I have a leg to stand on if I go to visit farmers in other countries from whom Level Ground buys and ask them to be organic in their farming practices and thoughtful around issues of sustainability when here at home I'm not expecting that of the groundskeeper of the local park or the farmer who produces product for our food system here. And I noticed this, do you? The, the double standard, where we have certain behaviors here that we might find reprehensible, but we don't try to stop. 
and then we want someone who's impoverished and maybe can't afford health care or education for their family, they're supposed to be organic, growing our coffee somewhere else. And I don't like that paternalistic approach to agriculture, that the people who have the least are then told by the people who have the most how they're supposed to behave, when we can't clean up the mess in our own backyard. So I'm really trying to find that level ground in all that I do, so that I've got a, a basis for understanding and a desire to curiously keep asking more. Um, people always ask us why we started, and I told you a little bit of that as I was getting ready to be a first-time dad. But my most, I guess, personal and honest answer about why we started Level Ground in 97 is that I came to a realization as I looked at poverty and orphans around the world that God deeply loves people who are poor. And I wanted my life to be positioned in the same biased and prejudicial way as I perceive God is in putting a positive, loving, and compassionate message out in all that I do. And so my original, I guess, response to the poverty I saw around me when I traveled as a guy in my early 20s was anger. I wanted to, like, break something or start a war or boycott. It was very aggressive. It was very violent. It was very vocal, and it was very mad. And I realized that would be a really crappy way to live my life. <laughs> you know, positioning artillery against what I didn't like. And we can all find great examples of bad run companies and ethics not in practice. And what I wanted to find is something that would be a more positive and life-giving response to the challenges we see around us. I love this quote. If wealth was the inevitable result of hard work and enterprise, every woman in Africa would be a millionaire. <laughs> How many of you have traveled to Africa at some point? A few? It's remarkable to watch the level of effort people put out in a lot of poorer countries and in Africa where I've traveled to see the effort and energy being expended and the not logical return on the effort expended. I've come to the understanding long ago that my lifestyle is subsidized by other people's poverty. Systems have been put in place long before we were around that created a total imbalance in how the world economy works. And one of my main missions in life in combating poverty is finding a way to, to better that system and make it more, more equal, more fair. There's also a lot of impersonalization in global trade. This is a container ship coming into the port of Seattle. And you think of what could be in those containers, right? It could be hardware, clothing, toys, food. Probably all of those things could be on any one container ship. We've got a habit on our packaging that we actually have the photo of an actual person who's a farmer in the co-op or producer group that we buy from. They're the an actual person who lives and works in that community producing that product. We currently on our coffee packaging have the GPS coordinates of the community from which we buy. And our goal is to take this global, otherwise very anonymous economy and say, here's a real person. We paid them actually to use their story and for the rights to use their photo and they actually are part of the group of people that produces this product that Level Ground imports. Trying to humanize trade so that it's not just a money decision when you buy a product, but it's actually a, this is someone's mother, this is someone's neighbor, this is a real farmer in a field working to produce a product that I'm gonna consume. So that it becomes a humanizing of the marketplace. Our mission's been this ever since we started in 97, to trade fair and direct, and to do it with small-scale producers, which we define as less than 10 acres, people with four hectares or less of land. The family that owns the farm lives on the farm. And except for peak harvest times when neighbors and friends might join, which is what I did, you know, getting hay in, in the Fraser Valley as a kid on farms. If the hay was coming in and there was a lot of it, the farm in and of itself couldn't get all the hay in, so your neighbors would come and help, and the next week you'd be helping the neighbors do the exact same. That's what's happening during mango harvest or during coffee harvest. Do you guys know what that is in that farmer's hand? Coffee beans. Right, coffee cherries. There's two beans in each one of those. That's right. And we're focusing strictly on working in developing countries and increasingly looking at areas in countries that are in conflict, that are in war, where there's a high risk, if not already, farmers are being displaced. Working with the premise that no one's actually mad at the farmer. No one is. The farmers are caught as victims in the crosshairs of different ideological struggles that people packing guns and artillery around have. And the farmers are actually feeding the people who are at war with each other. It's probably crops being stolen from them, but they're fueling the conflict. If all the farmers are driven out of a region, and we've seen this in some areas we trade in, the conflict leaves the region because you can't fuel the fight. And if you can resettle the land and establish a peaceful coexistence with the farming community, possibly some order can be restored. My business partner says often, where there's coffee, there's peace. 
things settle down. But if families are leaving with their kids because it's not safe anymore, there's no food left to fight over or to fight with. And underlying that mission is a vision to alleviate or to completely extinguish poverty. And that requires a lot of thought and a lot of engagement because we're not wanting to, in a formulaic way, say this worked in Colombia, now we're going to just take that and shove it onto Bolivia. It's got to be, what are the ingredients that bring about an alleviation of poverty? And we find time and again that it starts with a conversation and mostly listening and finding out what the farming community is wanting to see accomplished in a community and then building a trade relationship on their terms that's going to bring about the changes and the improvements that they look for. And you can't transplant an approach because it's going to be a different need in each community. So listening gets a lot more mileage than talking in those settings. Um, one thing which maybe you're quite aware of, but I'll, I'll give you my kind of bent on it in terms of why I believe we need to change our food system. And by that I mean especially that we need a better connection with seeds, with soils, and with farmers. Uh, premise being that if you have kids or grandkids that are in preschool or kindergarten and they get told as a class, we're going to go on a field trip and find out where our food comes from, you know where they go. They end up in the bakery at Thrifty Foods, <laughs> some place like that. The kid never gets dirty. You don't even have to put on boots to find out where your food comes from these days. Because it's not actually where your food comes from that you're taking on these field trips. If a kid's not on their hands digging through a compost pile, they're never going to understand where their food comes from. And we have that complete disconnect with our food. Like, I always see people shudder when I talk about my kids helping me butcher <coughs> roosters. But it's usually a person who just had a chicken burger in the last couple days. It's just they've never thought about slitting the throat of the animal they're going to eat. It becomes a much more significant experience eating an animal if you've raised and know the name of. Yeah. So I'll just go through these quickly. I won't do any long-winded. But we produce them. They estimate about double the calories of what our current population of the world needs. You've got poor people nutritionally need. No big surprise there. But this is my concern. The wealthiest are often the unhealthiest. It's determined now that kids and grandkids of those here in this room will be outlived in terms of numbers of years by us. We're going to outlive our kids, we're going to outlive our grandkids in terms of how many years we have on the planet, statistically speaking, because people are going to start dying younger rather than living longer. Technology is not going to make, make up for bad nutritional choices and sedentary lifestyles. When you drink your calories and sit and play Xbox, you're not going to live into your 80s. It's just not going to happen. You're going to have diabetes and die young. And that's happening statistically more and more. A lot of calories going to inefficient animals. This is really the get me as I start to source heirloom varieties of products. <clears throat> we don't have any GMO products in the level ground family, but heirloom varieties. In the last 100 years, we've lost 75% of the DNA of our seed. Only 25% of heirloom varieties are left out of what was there 100 years ago. So the food choices are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. <clears throat> And then you've got processed food that's energy intensive and nutritionally often quite deficient. Yeah? I just wanted to bring this point up from before as well that many calories go into inefficient animals. But when you're comparing you know, beef to chicken, and beef is a denser protein, so does that weigh into it a little bit? At least? You don't get more grams of protein per, per kilogram of meat from a cow than from a chicken. No? No. You get less dressed weight out of the starting weight and you just get about four times less efficient processes. So it's not beef is not in any way a better protein than no. I don't think anyone would contend in health or in fitness that beef lends a better protein. Not that I'm aware of. Chicken's actually the better protein. Generally, it's yeah. It's more bioavailable, the protein. Okay. Anyone else have a comment on that? Yeah, please open up the floor. Uh, yeah, I, I have one question because I, sure. I see how this system is really good and my question about it is okay so you've created a demand in those in, in those economies of those, those nations for this export product um, I um, observed when I was last in uh, Ethiopia that these cash crops, or even in this kind of a system, are taking up the best lands, and then the food crop, the, the indigenous food crops, are being 
left behind because they're they don't bring in the money that you exactly. can get. So the people are losing <coughs> nutritionally because then they're importing lesser quality stuff yeah. from elsewhere. That's actually another point I could add to this list. Export based cash crops for growing communities often decreases the efficiency and supply of their own food system. Mm -hmm. And I'll get to that further later, but that's a really valid point. I don't like the idea of even being considered as our company as a coffee roaster or that coffee should drive the economy of any country, though it's the primary cash export of 45 nations right now. These are countries where people are growing coffee, hoping they'll get cash at harvest time, and then they're going to take the cash and go to the market and buy food. And that's banking on a lot. That's banking on your currency, where it's maybe very up and down. We, we are familiar with that now more in Canada than maybe a year ago. Yeah. That's banking on climate change not messing with your crop. Commodity prices fluctuate like mad. It's playing a lot of risk to use your farmland to not feed your family. And that's increasingly a problem. Then a country like Ethiopia with an ever-growing population and the government controlling the land, and then you're being told by the co-op lead or the farm regional area manager to grow more export? I think that's ridiculous. I agree with you. Is there, have you found some way to remedy that? Or, you know? I'll talk about it more. Okay. Absolutely. Thanks. That's a great point. Absolutely. Uh, a huge challenge that fewer companies, everyone's heard of Monsanto, between Monsanto, DuPont, and Syngenta, I think they control close to 60% of the world's seeds and chemicals now. So you've got fewer and fewer companies controlling and now patenting different seed types and saying this seed only grows with the companionship of this pesticide or this herbicide. You've got more and more chemicals on crops. That destroys the whole carbon cycle and normal photosynthetic action. Currently, my understanding is that if 50 to 60% of the world's agricultural land was being grown organically, all currently regarded problematic carbon in the atmosphere would be sequestered back into the soil. But we've disrupted the natural carbon cycle by bombarding it with so many chemicals that carbon that's supposed to be fixed from the atmosphere to the soil, that's not happening because chemicals are messing up the cycle. There's no more carbon in the world than there's ever been. It's just supposed to be underground and it's up in the atmosphere. And if you want to go deep on that, read up at carbonunderground.com. It's a really interesting read to study and look at that. People are looking for patented ways to solve the carbon crisis and, and subvert climate change. Yeah, the patented newfangled way is grow organically. And nature will suck the carbon back into the soil. It's pretty clearly documented, but no one's going to make money off it. You won't have a product to sell you'll have a way of going back to maybe how two generations ago everyone was farming. Then you've got a lot of farming and transport that's speeding climate change further because people are eating less and less local, less and less seasonal even. And then you've got global trade that urges anonymity and ignorance. I, I call basically our current global food system ignorant exploitation. No one's out to hurt someone else, but systems have been well put in place and we're too busy earning money to buy stuff we want to actually slow down and rethink where our money goes, what system we're endorsing, what food we're embracing, and what the end result that is for the next couple generations after us. We have great opportunity and great information available to make changes. There's no doubt about that. So this is the bulk of our line of products. We started out with coffee from Colombia, right here. We've got coffees from six countries now. We've got a whole line of dried tropical fruits employing women who've been displaced by violence in Colombia. We've got cacao nibs, organic cane sugar, a line of loose leaf teas. Again, if you guys want more coffee or tea, just feel free to grab some. It's right there. And then coconut oil and vanilla beans. And we'll talk about the rice as well, which doesn't fit on the slide. So we started purchasing from South America. And then we started getting products from Africa. And then our tea from Assam in India. Our spices are coming from Sri Lanka. And our um, rice and coconut oil is coming from the Philippines. Any, I'll just pause and should be working at all of these, and this is a condensation of what's considered the 10 principles of fair trade. I don't know when to stop pushing the button. I think I've got one more. There. And I believe that if I'm to pick my favorite or the most significant of all those, it's actually long-term relationships. When you've got good friends who are your farming partners, you trust and dialogue regularly, you're always communicating back and forth, 
And out of that, something really powerful happens. We've never stopped a trading relationship we've started. But it sometimes takes a year or two to get one going, and then two or three more years until their product hits the market. We're probably hundred, several hundred thousand dollars into a product before it shows up on a store shelf here in Victoria. And so it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of thoughtfulness to get that product ready to get it out to market. But the key in it all is that the farming community knows that we're not going to stop. I always say to them, kind of jokingly, and it's usually through an interpreter, I'm not here to date you. I'm here to consider if we're going to get married. Right? This has to be a lifer. We've got to commit. And I want to take a lot of time, and I want you to take a lot of time to think about, is this where we want to go? Because our goal is to trade direct with you and change the situation for your future. When your kids are growing and you're gone, and they're still a partner with level ground trading, what do you think it should look like? Let's think that far ahead. That's the goal. So this is a little bit about coffee. And I'll just say right up front, I hope you have questions. About any of those or other things as well. Yeah. About, now, I wanted to know what, uh, what um, uh, upholding the rights of women and children mean. Like, what, how does that work in there? How is that applied? That looks like a lot of things, and it depends on the community. It depends a lot on the community and the country we're in. And that's why I have to I have to couch every answer to a question like yours into like which country do you want to talk about? Because I go to the Philippines and I see women running the show in the farming community growing our rice. I go to Ethiopia and in the areas where I've been, the treatment that I see of women and children would be by Canadian standards deplorable. Do I have a right as a buyer to tell them how to treat their women and children when it's my first or second visit? My business partner's there annually. I'm not there often. So creating a dialogue around this matters to us. This is critical to us as buyers. It's even more critical to the customers. But I'm not presuming that I will start a trade relationship with a community when they've got everything figured out and working according to Canadian standards. I find that paternalistic. And I find it very top down to say, I'm going to export my values to you, and if you want my money and I'll buy your product, you've got to treat your wife the way I treat my wife. I don't think it's any But I mean, it's all sorts of dialogue on that. Go ahead. Educating somebody about what the benefits of organics are, as well as what the benefits of treating a woman equally or children yeah. with respect. Is that, I don't think that's like pushing your values, that's explaining the reason why. I think they have different degrees of emotion in the room when you bring up how to grow food organically and how to treat your wife. That's my experience. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I understand <laughs> that, but how, how else is change going to take place if there isn't an alternative even presented as a model? I'll give you an example. My wife does all the trade relationships in India. And you're dealing now in a caste system where there's people who are born into a situation where they're told, this is what you'll do for life, and this is all you'll do. It's a pretty overwhelming from a Canadian perspective that that's the way they're living, right? And I'll, I'm going to get product by product into different things we do and how we trade in certain communities. But my wife sitting on the ground is taking notes, listening and asking questions and speaking at times. She came back from her most recent trip to India, and I was asking her exactly about this. I'm like, does it just drive you nuts? Like seeing people being treated in this way, but there's so much opportunity. She says the change we've seen in two years is like meteoric. The opportunities for these people in the last two years since we started engaging the farmers and talking about treating people with dignity and what fair payment looks like, we've created a conversation where I never dreamed two years ago we could go. And I says, and where are you at now? She says, I've got so many questions that I think I'll be able to ask them next time. But they weren't ready for it this time. And so it's like, I guess the key in fair trade in all that I've studied and learned over the years, it's like life. You're looking at for constant progression. So how do you look to evolve to the next step the next time? And I'm always trying to push the envelope in a way that's respectful and keeps the dialogue open. And keep in mind, we are not a development agency. We're not a human rights organization. We're not funded to address women's rights or any of those other factors. We purchase a product that's high quality at top price, and we endeavor to accurately communicate the farmer community message with the product to the consuming community as a for-profit local business. So the, the women in Colombia that have been displaced by violence, yep. for instance, are there no men in that kind of situation? Their husbands have all been killed. Okay, so in, in that 
So is, there's no uh, other women's cooperative that is not women that are widows, but you know women that do have husbands but can be independent of. of. Uh, you know what I, I'm saying is like, is there? Do you have any models of where women are the the cooperative owners of mm -hmm. of the? Yeah. Peru's probably been the best example of women's rights coming forward, where the women went from the men didn't let them in the room for meetings 10 years ago, and now the women are discussing whether the men should be allowed in the room. <laughs> They've totally taken over in a very positive way. A woman named Esperanza leads the co-op in Peru that we buy from. And she's been very significant in changing the mentality of the men who did not value or understand what their woman was worth. How did that come about? Was there any so, such detailed questions? I don't know if I'm, I can I'm go sorry. on. Like, okay. I love okay. the level that you're talking about. This sorry. is why I prefaced with, take my card and let's talk further. Okay. But I love your questions. They're awesome. And that's why every region we go to, I've got totally different discussion points on the same topic. Yeah. So anything about coffee is what I was going to jump into next. And these are different areas of questions that I know people might get to. Um, Coffee, if you haven't seen it fresh picked, usually a two meter tall bush if it's kept in check. In a year, it'll produce about 10 pounds if it's healthy of ripe red cherries. But once you take off the outer red peel, dry the beans, get them roasted, there's weight loss all along the way as it moves from a wet, pulped piece of fruit to a dried, roasted bean. It goes from 10 pounds to one pound off the tree. <laughs> so one pound of beans off one tree in one year means 40 or 50 cups. So who here is a two cup a day person or more? Two cup a day is 15 trees. That's a little forest of coffee trees just for you, right? So it's a lot of impact environmentally. It's a lot of labor from a human perspective. This is all hand picked, every single bean. I believe it's 4,000 ripe cherries to get 8,000 beans to get one pound of coffee. So it's a lot of labor. The number one comment we get from taking people to Origins to visit coffee, the first comment all the time is, I can't imagine how inexpensive coffee is now that I've seen the labor that goes into producing coffee. There's just so much going on, so much level of detail. This is right coffee at the uh, co-op in Ethiopia. This is a very um, basic mill to take the pulp off. This is a, a larger scale mill. It's actually using water from the river. It's deep pulping. And it's actually, you can see three channels here. The farthest channel is the highest quality the nearest to me channel is the lowest quality. It's usually flotation to sort. Better quality is, is denser. Lower quality is lighter and floats easier, so flotation of coffee when it's wet is the best way to sort it. It's taken out here. This is where the coffee's going to dry on those raised racks after it's been washed. Sit there for a day after it's been washed, then it'll dry. How clean is the water? This is um, water being diverted from the local river, and it's purposely been built, this whole uh, facility on a slope back to the river. So they have numerous, ever lower ponds returning to the river. So the water fills up one pond, overflows, goes to the next, goes to the next. The sediment sinks to the bottom. So the water returns to the river very clean through just filtration through the pond systems. And then in dry season, they drop a ladder down each pit, and they go down with buckets and take out all the mucilage and compost and sediment. It goes back to the farms, gets put around the drip line of the coffee bushes. So it's fertilizer, basically, the compost coming out of those pits. In Canadian dollars, what would one of those farmers get paid? It would depend on the amount of land they're handling. They would be dealing with, um, usually, honestly, 300 to $500 a year. I had my son when he was 12 with me. We were standing in front of an Ethiopian home. 13 people lived in it. And the entire house was built in a circle from here to the window. Dirt floor. And we were asking exactly that question. <laughs> and the answer was, this family makes about $300 a year from coffee. And my son leaned over to me and said, Dad. He's in grade seven. I spend more in a year on Slurpees than they earn as a family. He got it. Like, he saw how weird the world is. And that's why I was mentioning about Kabetti, the guy where I said every day, three times a day, we need a farmer. 
coffee alone isn't going to fix any economic challenge in a community where you've got a piece of land smaller than a building lot in Victoria. These are farmers in Ethiopia that we buy from. Many of them have 5,000 to 10,000 square feet. We have houses bigger than their land. Their farms aren't farms in the Canadian sense at all. They're backyard gardens. They've got a cow or a goat, some false banana trees, and some other fruits and veggies, and some coffee trees, but it's all in a tiny, tiny plot. Colombians would dry their coffee on a flat concrete surface or a rooftop. Coffee will take a few weeks to dry. It's sorting through the beans. If it's chipped, damaged, discolored, has insect marks on it, it'll all get taken out to be sold at a lower price. You see mechanized labor. Mechanized sorting, rather, where labor costs are high. So Columbia would have laser sorting with puffs of mechanical air shooting out the beans that are lower quality. But in Ethiopia, where labor costs would be lower, the price of a machine is far too high. So you pay people to do the work. I guess that's like, that's like the good Coleman coffee cost $30, $35 a pound. It's being grown on U.S. land. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they were asking here the other day when we were there. Yeah. <laughs> this is Josh, our roast master, looking at coffee. Uh, he's the head judge for the Canadian National Barista Championship, so he oversees quality control for a lot of competitive baristas in the small micro roaster cafe market in Canada. My business partner, Ugo, on the left, with one of his friends, Jono, who runs a chain of cafes in South Africa. They're, I think, in Rwanda here, cupping just a few months ago. This is in our warehouse where our coffee starts if you come on a tour. That's actually what the what our back warehouse looked like today. We just got in a full truckload from the Vancouver warehouse where most of our beans are stored. 60 or 70k sacks. Yeah. Uh, we roast in very small batches. The finished roast of each of our roasters is less than 65 pounds, like 30 kilos finished. So we're doing a very small batch um, to try to really control the quality of the roasts. Uh, did you have questions about coffee before I go on to drive three? Yeah. Which happens to be your most popular seller? Our biggest selling coffee is Tanzanian and Columbia is second. Yeah. They're both dark roast, which seems to be more the direction of West Coast appetites. Yeah, yeah. Which has the least acid? Our Bolivian. Our Bolivian coffee has the least acid because of the soil conditions. Yeah. Much, much lower. For people who get like an upset stomach from coffee, Bolivia is what I would recommend. Difference between dark roast and medium roast as far as seeding level? What do you think, Paul? I've never heard that there is. I think it's more the growing conditions from what yeah, Josh I think said. the soil um, far more confirms that than the, the, the roast. Okay. Yeah. How do you decaf your coffee? Uh, we decaf our coffee in Colombia, so it's a Colombian owned facility in the province adjacent to where our coffee's grown. And they use Italian technology that was brought in and set up. And it's a company that takes uh, green beans that would be otherwise ready to roast. And they put them in water in a big bath. And they add um, molasses that comes from locally produced cane sugar. Uh, ripe fruits and veggies and ripe cane sugar has something in it that naturally occurs called ethyl acetate. And ethyl acetate attracts caffeine molecules out of coffee. So that rises to the surface, the molasses mixed with the caffeine that comes out of the beans and gets skimmed off the top. Then the water gets drained out of the bath, and the green beans get dried again, and they look a little more brown when they've been decaffeinated. I believe to sell it decaffeinated in Canada, legally it has to be lab tested at least 97.5% caffeine free. So you can't have more than like 2 or 2.5% two caffeine content. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing then is the molasses gets sold together with the caffeine that's in it to Coca-Cola bottling, and that becomes the base for their syrup for Coke in Colombia. So it's caffeine extracted naturally from coffee with cane sugar molasses as the sweetener. Yeah. I don't know of another company that gets decaf that's not done in North America. Like, we're the only one I know that get it done in the country of origin. Our goal is always as much value added back where the farming community is as possible. Yeah. That's in Colombia. Yeah. So is it um, um, better I, I see it as a moot point to discuss nutrition and coffee. It's a pleasurable beverage. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. 
It's a good source of antioxidants. One has more oil. Oh, there's all sorts of different, like, but it's nuances. Like, everyone's heard that probably a darker roast has less caffeine than a lighter roast, because the longer you expose it to heat, the more you drive the caffeine out. But the difference is to the second or third decimal place. Like, it's all so infinitesimal. Let's just admit we drink coffee because we like the taste of it. That, that's kind of where I, I, I always am hesitant to go into health claims about food we sell. Uh, there's lab, you know, ingredient-related panels on all of our food that has to be lab-tested for the ingredients, but... I'll tell you which coffee I like the most and why I like it, but I don't drink my coffee for health purposes. <laughs> Paul's convinced it's full of antioxidants. I'll go with it. Our dried fruit, we have a bunch of varieties now, five different ones. We do struggle to keep the mango in stock. It's the most popular, and it's seasonally available only 60 to 90 days in Colombia. It tends to just run out before the next harvest comes. Uh, one of our real uh, neat points in the last year or two is that the main, one of the main ingredients in our exotic, which is our newest one, is dragon fruit. And dragon fruit also tends to have a seasonal harvest, and thankfully it's on the opposite side of the calendar. So it's nice that the staff are, are able to be busy throughout the year on things like coconut, banana, golden berries, which are always available. But the mango has a very focused season, and the opposite side of the calendar is dragon fruit. Um, that's how we get it when we get it into level ground. A case of 12, and every package inside that case of 12 is ready to sell and scan at the till. The packaging, the box, everything's done in Columbia. So 100% value added there. The other thing that's really key from a sustainability standpoint is that if you take a fresh ripe mango, and this is a very large variety that we purchase for drying, it's called a quiete or a keith, up to a kilo fresh, one mango. But about 90 plus percent of the fresh fruit weight stays behind as compost and moisture. And on average, about 9% of the fresh fruit weight leaves the country. So this year, we're going to buy 10 full shipping containers of dried fruit. But if it was fresh, that would have been over 100 containers. Yeah. Now imagine the next uh, trucker strike at the Port of Vancouver. And we have containers of fruit that have sat there for two months. It would all rot, right? But this is shelf stable. And there's no fillers in it, there's no additives, there's no sugars, no preservatives. So if you want to just take fruit and dry it organically like we do, you have to get it truly dry. You can't fake it. A lot of dried fruit with sugars and preservatives has a lot of moisture in it. It's very cheap to sell water to customers. But if you get it dry enough so it's shelf stable, then you're truly just getting that dried fruit. And it's generally shelf stable for two years plus. Uh, the Red Cross has adopted this technology that we've introduced there. It's very simple, it just hadn't been done before, for feeding a lot of displaced populations. And the women all working in the facility have themselves been displaced. Together with the farmers and the people transporting and the people cutting and drying and packaging, there's 200 people full-time employed from this company we started in Columbia about 12 years ago. We buy about half their annual output and European and American markets buy the other half. We've urged them to not focus just on selling to us so that they have you know, more, more versatility. The tea it comes from a sam in the northeast of India. State by state, just like province by province here, there's different minimum wages. This is the lowest state minimum wage in the country. Um, sorry, my question for sport just before this. Yeah. I'm noticing containers, big trucks and stuff. Yeah. Do you mind speaking briefly to transportation emissions and any mitigation strategies that your company employs? Yeah, we're always looking to fill a container, to ship it as efficiently as possible, to do as much value added as possible. We've audited all of those processes, and we have a pie chart that breaks down where all of our energy usage is. It really goes three ways for us as a company. It's shipping it in, it's roasting coffee, and it's shipping it out. And shipping it out is far more expensive from an emission standpoint than shipping it in, because sea freight's how we get everything. It's the most efficient way to move product around the world. We can't sea freight to the prairies. So perlator trucks and Canada Post trucks and such come to us. We've audited um, all of our carriers that are moving outside of where our vans deliver. And we chose Perlator for the bulk of what we move because they look at exactly these types of things. They've been far more forthright and transparent with their strategies and their practices. They've got the largest, I believe, electric vehicle fleet in the world for delivery of product. And they're very thoughtful around communicating that and monitoring it and decreasing it. So transportation is our biggest factor and the one we have very little control over other than choosing who transports for us. But it's generally sea freight in trucks out. Rail? Um, 
rail doesn't really work because for us we're shipping often a box to a customer. Right. So if we filled whole rail cars, that would work. Yeah. But if you have like a health essentials equivalent and it's in Moose Jaw or Saskatoon and they order two or three cases, we have to use something like Canada Post or Perlator. If we end up with a whole container of coffee that for some reason gets rerouted out of Africa and ends up landing on the east coast of North America, then we try to rail it across the country to get it to us if it didn't come through the port of Vancouver. When we have a full load, then that's viable, and we do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just wondering about your packaging, what it's made from and how, who makes it, how that's, where do you make it, or is that oh, also sustainable? Wow. Um, yeah, I'm one of the people closer to that. I'm always working on improving and changing that. <laughs> um, I think I'd cover that with you later because my short answer is an hour long. Um, our biggest challenge is this. We have to reflect our brand well in terms of people seeing it, spotting it, noticing it. It has to be bilingual. It's got to have high print fidelity so graphic designers work is well rendered. We want to communicate a farmer image and all this messaging. And then we want the product to be really high quality when customers get it. And the factors around quality preservation of the product are the biggest contributor to what the package is made of, which is always a multiply of something. So we tried really hard, for instance, with the rice, which we've just launched, to go to a paperboard box, food grade paper, made from all recycled materials, fully recyclable. It's been a complete bomb. I love the idea of the rice box. It was my idea. I love the rice box. It costs us so much to package. It doesn't create a sufficient barrier for food safety in my mind compared to what most customers demand. The pour spout hasn't been perfect. It's got piles of challenges. And yes, from an environmental standpoint, it's absolutely the best package we've ever done. We won't do it again. We're already going to plan to change it. Um, and for coffee, we try to ship everything very fresh to our customers, and you have to keep out air and you have to keep out light. So you have to have foil and plastic generally. There's very little revolution in the packaging industry. The bit that is is very hard. We're going to launch something brand new in 2015 that's never been done in North America before in packaging. I won't go further than that, but it's going to cost us a lot to implement. It's going to cost us way more per unit to ongoing do. And my fingers are crossed because I don't have a single industry on board with what everyone says is revolutionary. So we're trying hard. And it's always frustrating for me. <laughs> positive energy, positive energy. <laughs> uh, the tea comes, oh, there, sorry, are there other questions? I don't want to run out of time either. What if you just say I have to go home now and then I don't get to finish? What time are we at, by the way? 10 to 8. 10 to 8. Forge ahead. Forge ahead. OK. Any other questions? Okay. The tea that we sell is all loose leaf. Did anyone try the lemongrass tonight? Yeah. Yeah, maybe? Very good. Very pleased with it. It's our newest tea. It's herbal. So all of our tea itself that actually is from the Camellia sinensis tea plant is from India. But this is an herbal, so it's all from our spice producers in Sri Lanka who produce the spices as well for our chai. As I mentioned, the tea is from Assam in the north of India. So you're bordered by like China, Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, quite a turmoil area. A lot of different people groups, a lot of different languages. Nine tiny gardens we buy from, on average two acres each, spread out over a thousand kilometers of roadway. When my wife goes to visit each farm, she has to take 20 days banging around on public bus and traveling place to place to meet all the farmers. We've only twice had all our growers meet together because they're so distant from one another. And that was for one primary purpose, get them all in a room with a professional tea cupper so that they could all taste their teas with a palate coaching them from someone who's an industry professional. And when they can taste a different way to prepare post-harvest preparation of the green or the black or whatever it is they're preparing, generally speaking, the cupper could communicate to them how they could get about 20% more rupees for a kilo of tea by changing their processes. And that's the life-changing experience for a gardener, to understand that hands-on part they can change. The tea system is very old, it's very set in its ways, and it's built on massive plantation estates owned by very wealthy people, and they're drenched in chemicals every day. So this is a very extreme departure to tiny, small scale, finishing the tea on site, grown without any chemicals. 
it, it's absolutely revolutionary. In fact, mm -hmm. the people who've represented us and worked with us have gone to the Tea Board of India to present this model of tea production and been told by the dignitaries of the Tea Board of India, this can never be done and will never be done. They're so like, no, no, we're not asking for consent. It's already happening. We're doing it. We have farmers producing tea this way. Like, no, you don't. We're importing it to Canada. We are. It's happening. No, this has never been done. It can't be done. Like, they just can't even hear that this is possible. It, it's really cool. My wife, Laurie, meeting Gobin, who does the black tea that goes into our chai. And this is coming out of spring. This is coming out of winter, rather, into spring, kind of like where we're at in our season now. Uh, winter's finished, the bushes have been pruned, the leaves are just coming out. And tea, as you likely know, if it's good tea, it's just the top two leaves in the bud that are hand-plucked. And you just keep plucking the leaves on a regular basis off these perennial bushes. And within 12 hours, you need to thoughtfully dry that tea. And the leaves are what you end up drinking the flavor off of, right? It's the same plant that turns into our black tea, the tea in our chai tea, our green tea. It's all starting out as the exact same plant, just prepared through different processes. This is a, a conventional garden on the bottom versus one of our gardens on the top that we buy from. Conventional garden, I call it shock and awe farming. Um, you've got naked bare earth that actually doesn't absorb moisture when a tropical rain hits. It just runs off. So you've got trenches dug, and the gardeners know it's toxic chemical runoff is going to poison water supply, so they try to direct the trenches away from homes and away from wells and aquifers. There's no leaf litter, there's no branches, there's no debris, so that means there's no cover for insects or for worms. When you walk through it, the only living thing, and it's in quotations, living thing, is plants that are propped up on chemicals. These like are steroid-ridden bodybuilders, these, these tea plants. They have massive infestations of a black beetle or a red spider all at once. And then the farmer goes in and sprays to just eradicate. There's no balance with nature. <laughs> There's no diversity of cropping. There's no thoughtfulness. We've proven mathematically, and farmers are getting it, that you can produce the same volume of tea organically as with chemicals. But you have to put your money into labor rather than chemicals. India needs more employment, it doesn't need more chemicals. So it's a gradual conversion process for people to hear that and to ponder. This looks very dirty and unkept, it's exactly what we want. All sorts of debris and leaf litter for bugs and worms to hide under. Lots of other plants growing in amongst. Fully absorbs the moisture when it hits rather than running off. And the biggest thing my wife notes all the time is the songs of birds in an organic garden. Because there's life and there's food. And so the birds are there dealing with that. Um, let's see. This is pretty typical. No protective gear. Chemicals usually from North American companies. Typically chemicals that are banned in North America. But you could own shares in them in your investments. And then sell those banned chemicals to other farmers elsewhere. Daily, pesticide and herbicide sprayed right on the leaf. And then keep in mind, those leaves will be plucked. Processed. You'll pour hot water over them. And marketing boards will tell you all over the place, tea is a healthy beverage. And you're drinking a toxic soup. So CBC Radio went deep on this in 2014, around this time last year. You can still go to the link on the line. And they had an independent lab test all the major brands of tea on grocery and health food store shelves across Canada. And as you can read there, more than half of them tested above the allowable pesticide residual levels. The CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, is supposed to set residual levels that you can't go above. They set the levels. More than half the company's brands went above the levels. It was proven. The CFA was asked for comment, and they said consumers shouldn't be concerned. So that's who's keeping our food system safe. Pretty freaky. Not my cup of tea. Not my cup of tea. No kidding. Tenzing is one of the guys who grows black tea for us. After his father passed away, he took over the family garden, came back to live with his mom. And he's got a little garden, which was the, it's in the family, and his father always gardened conventionally, lots of chemicals. Tenzing started out as a gardener doing that as well. My point in this is that every one of our gardeners has their own story of what turned them on to being organic. And on a given day, one of Tenzing's workers had one of the backpack sprayers on. He went to the pond in the center of the garden where all the water runs. It's where they get their cooking water and their laundry water, and it's where they at any time or mined at any time, the whole paddy system completely collapses. What that means is that controlled water being let out of the mountains, forests, comes down gradually to the shoreline. 
But any place where mining and forestry has taken place, or dole pl pineapple plantations have gone in, which is very prolific throughout the Philippines, and the worst floods, especially on the island of Mindanao, around Cagayan de Oro in the last couple of years, just thousands of acres get turned into pineapple plantations in dry season, and then rainy season comes, and a half million person city downstream gets washed into the ocean. Like, they're not thinking and connecting the dots. But in conventional forestry and mining, all the sedimentation comes down and it covers the coral reef at the shoreline. And just that thin layer of sedimentation, it extinguishes all the fish stocks in one year. 80% of all known rice varieties in the world ever grown are from the Philippines. 80% of all coral species known in the world are from the Philippines. And if you farm rice badly inland, you lose your fish stocks at the shore. I never realized that the rice I ate would affect the fishery that fed the people. So it's pretty powerful. It's very powerful. <laughs> a little bit about sustainability from our company's vantage point. I've always maintained that it's from long-term relationships. I know that we kind of tongue-in-cheek talk about tree huggers and people who are championing the environment and trying to save a plant or a species at a time. But I think we all understand that it's on someone's land where that species or that tree resides or lives or has its habitat. And the degree to which we sustain the relationship with the people on the land is the degree to which they can hopefully competently steward the species on their land. And when there's uncertainty, climate change, unpredictable pricing, a lot of that worry, I think, gets reflected in bad farming practices. So I believe that if we have predictable orders, and we live by this at Level Ground, predictable orders and consistent prices with our farming partners, we create basically a situation of confidence and trust. And out of that, we don't see farmers making panic decisions that destroy the environment. We see them making thoughtful long-term decisions because they've got a buying relationship intact and they can trust what's going to happen next harvest. Try to find farmers who know this year what they're going to get paid next year for harvest. It doesn't usually happen anywhere in Canada or in the local markets even. We're trying to do that with marginalized farmers in other countries to create that stabilizing environment. So this is my premise for sustainability. Hug a farmer. Hug a farmer. That's the way we need to roll. Just at home here in our own facility, this is just kind of my wrap up. We've been 10 years landfill free. This is our 11th year being landfill free, nothing being sent to Heartland. We have, um, as you know, six streams of recycling through the CRD and the Blue Box program at the curb, but there's another seven streams we pay for recycling. So we gather it into a shipping container we keep stored in our parking lot, and all of our staff can bring all of their recycling that's beyond the Blue Box from home, dump it in there for free, and then we pay for that. So when you start working at level ground, your household can be landfill free. One of our biggest um, byproducts from our facility is the empty coffee sacks, which are compostable, biodegradable. They're a great ground cover, which a lot of local small-scale farmers use. It keeps the weeds down, lets the worms come to the surface. And in a year's time on the soil, with these rains we have here, the sack completely turns to dirt. So you actually are nourishing your soil by putting down a ground cover on it. And then the other big byproduct we have from our roasting is coffee chaff that comes out. We have it in these 200-liter totes on our back loading bay. And that gets picked up and gets mixed with food waste from local restaurants. And it suppresses the odor of rotting food, especially in summertime. It absorbs the moisture that comes off of your food scrapings from your plate. And it makes way better compost because it's a good carbon-nitrogen mix. And then that gets sold as a finished product in the coffee sacks. They're the containers for the finished compost. Our only dumpster is for cardboard. We track how all of our staff get to and from work every day because we're not really in a residential neighborhood. We're out on the peninsula on Heating Crossroad. So you can see from here, you could click on any one of these on our site. You'd find out every person's name under every commuting mechanism. That's an in-house tool we have. But 37% of all of our commuting last calendar year was offset by us paying our staff to ride their bikes, take the bus or carpool. And we put that money on people's every second week paycheck just to offset that. And then thanks to people like Paul, as I mentioned earlier, we reclaim empty packages. We got back about 44,000 last year from people who finished with our coffee, brought it back, and out of that we created a job for a woman named Nahid. She came here with her four kids as a refugee. She'd been a professional seamstress in Iran where she grew up. We rented space for her downtown at Community Micro Lending, so she has a key to an office there. We put a commercial sewing machine in there for her. And then she takes what would have been landfill, but people have thoughtfully brought back those packages and she sews them into finished tote bags like this. So one of my 
requests to you is if you know of a conference coming up that you're going to be part of or that you know someone's going to attend, Nahid has made a lot of these bags. And we try to give some products away at silent auctions and at fundraisers, and the bag is the container for our products. But I love to have these as delegate bags at conferences. So when people register and they get their schedule and maybe a few goodies, it's actually a bag made from diverted materials that created a job. So that would be a great reason, please, to take my card. If you can contact me later and say, I know of a conference, there's going to be these delegates, and they have a budget, they can, and maybe, we'll always cut our price on the bag to keep Nahib busy and to keep reclaiming um, packages. So that can be a, a good thing for us. So that's what we're working on, is rebuilding and rethinking our food system and addressing poverty at the heart relationally with marginalized farmers. And I'll stick around for questions or for chats as long as you want. If you like us on Facebook, that would be appreciated at Level Ground Trading. Um, if there's anything else that you guys <coughs> run the store would like to bring up or mention, or if there's other deeper questions, I'm glad to stick around. And these for tours, if you want to take a tour invite. Yeah. Sure. yeah.